starting with the idea of the avant-garde. I mean, you know, I've always said that if it looks like the avant-garde and it smells like the avant-garde, then it's not the avant-garde. And it wasn't, I wasn't the only one who said that. Apparently Duchamp said something very much like that, and so did Willem de Kooning. Um, there is an incendiary brilliance to the early years of modernism that has an authenticity that uh, I, I can't be denied. And it's, uh, it's growing out of a very close memory to what the mother load of <coughs> Western art had been. There are certain modernists who I think really have attempted to uh, 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 enhance a dia their dialogue with the old masters, with not just the old masters, but previous art. There were some, ar some artists, like the futurists, who were fascists, who wanted to burn the museums. And uh, those people, I think, were, were, I mean, they supported Mussolini. They were, they were animals, as far as I'm concerned. But I don't see, feel that way about Picasso, and I don't feel that way about Matisse. Um, I think that one of the things we're here to talk about, I think, is the uh, future possibilities for uh, painting, uh, representational painting, figure of painting, painting of the figure. Um, and, um, you know, I've talked for a long time, and what I've actually been struck by meeting the incoming students and watching students leave the academy um, is the idea that um, the entire pedagogical agenda of uh, teaching students has to be revamped, painters in particular. I think that we come out of school or we go into our undergraduate training being uh, instructed by people who really are just, you know, uh, toting the line. They have certain kinds of when they're not talking about forcing the artists into conceptual agendas, they're telling them stuff about figuration and representation that I think is, is anachronistic and, and meaningless and doesn't provide equipment. I mean, let's face it, we look around us, there's a lot of representation in the world nowadays. We see yeah. it, if you just go on the internet, you look at this stuff. Now, take a look at it. I mean, it does, it, the fact that it's there doesn't really mean much to me because 95% of it is just, ugh. You know, just like 95% of abstraction is terrible. So it's not an issue of whether or not it's representational or there's abstraction. It's an issue of painting. The thing that's really threatened is painting. And so to reinvest in what painting means, what it is now, you know, and understanding what it has been is a very important way in which we can sort of address mm -hmm. and face the, the future. For example, you know, um, I, th I think that we, uh, it's an important idea to, when, I'm, when I'm teaching to go back to the absolute basics of painting, of visual, visualization, and to try to rewrite in a certain sense the way we have looked at certain things. Instead of, for example, Odd will just assume a position of Rembrandt or assume a position of illumination of form that comes from the Dutch Caravaggisti, eventually from Caravaggio, I would be more interested in talking to students and saying, if you want to construct a light mass on a figure, okay, where does that come from historically? What is the significance of it? Now, to use your imaginations or to apply a kind of heuristic plasticity to your understanding of this, which is kind of what painters do all the time. I mean, they, 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 they don't necessarily read the texts of history and then follow to the letter the texts of history. You know, they don't need to justify what they do by some kind of, uh, you know, a pre-existing text or evidence that this was the case. They're keeping a ball in motion, and so they look beyond even the text. Sometimes they do it in a very stupid way, and, but, but in the best ways, they're reinventing an idea of history, an idea of how painting has been used, what the techniques of painting actually mean, and what they refer to when you apply them to your own work. You know, one of the things that we were talking about color and the separation of color from the thing. It's very important for me to say, I, I, one of the things I get, in, I, I, I encounter in art schools is that, you know, the, the kids have, the kids, they're, they're adults, they have, you know, they've got all these colors. All these colors come in the kit. And they don't know what colors to use, really. And they could draw really well, Basically, drawing comes naturally to so many people, but when it comes to actually painting the stuff, they freak out. 
Everybody freaks out. Hey, I'm just saying this because I've freaked out. I've totally, I, I could draw, I could draw, and then when it's coming to painting, it's like, oh shit, I don't know what I'm doing. Oh, excuse my language. Uh, so, you know, color, how do you approach color, this vast array of colors that you're given, when you're really interested in the structure of form the way it was, you know, in, say, Caravaggio's day, or Rembrandt's day, if you want to learn about that, what do you do with all those other colors? You know, why is it that, you know, I wonder if people ask themselves, why is it that after Delacroix and after Manet, virtually nobody of the more advanced artists ever painted a torso illuminated with three quarters light and one quarter shadow? What happened at that moment that shifted the emphasis from form and its, and its demonstration by illumination to color? And it's at that moment, and it's Delacroix who enacts that change in the journal May 5th, 1852. The painting should be constructed as if on a gray day the passage begins. That he creates the springboard that will serve as the, the, uh, the, uh, the, um, uh, like the call of the uh, Impressionists. They no longer painted form illuminated. They painted shadow, and they painted half light. And that was what Delacroix's answer to the privilege that was ascribed to form for all of those years. That's the moment when the ultra-subjective is born. Because form always represented a kind of rational, structural marker within painting. And once form was, was deconstructed by the you know, privileging of color over that, of the halftones and the shadows over the illuminated mass, then all of a sudden you have this idea of color and its ultra-subjective, its sensate nature, its ultra-sensate nature. Um, so what I'm saying is basically when we teach students today, we need to explain to them or at least encourage them to think about where form originated. What is the relationship between Caravaggio and linear perspective, for example? You know? Invent, invent something, think it through and find a relationship between this. Why does mannerism exist between the Renaissance and the Baroque? What is mannerism's relationship? You know, you can't just sort of like look at the stuff and say, oh, okay, I think I'll make up a story about that. Like, uh, you can't. You need to sort of think about why Neoplatonism had such an important role in the development of imagery, not just imagery, but the manner of the technical narrative of paintings. You know, so the be we have to go back to the very beginning. What is color? Why do we use so many colors today? Why is color ultra subjective? Why was color always considered to be ephemeral and uh, undependable? And why is form considered to be was always considered to be stable? So if you choose to paint like odd and you choose to paint with with a formal structure to your work that is sort of based on illumination. You may be part of a, of a group of people in the history of the world who felt that they wanted to hold on to some strange, even, even convoluted idea of reason. That reason is, takes precedence over sensation in painting, you know? Um, anyway, I think, but that, that, that I think is where the future of this has to go. It has to be, re, the curriculum has to be rewritten. Students have to really know art history before they come to school. Uh, I don't know how many times I've had students, graduate students, who don't even know who Tintoretto is, you know, and it's like, that breaks my heart, you know? And then if you're going to make a painting, for example, if you're a scientist, you're, going to, you're an immunologist, and you're going to write a paper on immunology, you investigate everything that has possibly been written about your hypothesis before you actually pose your, present your information. Students come to art school nowadays without any idea, really, of what has gone on in the history of art and why it happened. They haven't developed their own personal narratives about how this possibly happened. You know, why it went from here to there. Uh, who are these artists? Why did they paint this way then and not this way back, you know, uh, 10 years ago? You know, they don't know this stuff, and yet they try to reinvent the wheel. Now, it's very easy for people to come out and make spectacular displays like the fountain in Versailles, you know, this fountain thing, um, but nothing in our culture supports the education of the painter. So painting will die, painting will wither on the vine. You know, uh, unless we change the course of our a pedagogical approach to teaching, to, uh, to the education of artists, and uh, we try to build an enthusiasm for serious art, 
serious painting. It, it could be ironic painting. It could be conceptual painting. It could be abstract painting. It could be humorous painting. But painting, what makes it painting? Why painting as opposed to something else? What is a painting? It's a void. A can empty canvas is the void you're talking about. And when you populate it with things, you're toting the void in order to protect yourself against falling into oblivion, to a kind of uh, non-identity. And so the things you populate your pictures with, the things that you do, the technical devices that you use, are means of dispelling despair, the ultimate despair of the void. You know? That's why I think odds figures float in voids often. It's because they're almost as if like they're, they're still there. They're almost like flotage of a, after the Titanic wreck. You know, floating by and they're still there, but you know what I mean? Yeah. Kind of like,